Welcome, everyone, to Family Talk. It's a ministry of the James Dobson Family Institute, supported by listeners just like you. I'm Dr. James Dobson, and I'm thrilled that you've joined us. Well, welcome to Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh. Now, as you probably know, the horrific law known as Roe v. Wade was finally overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court on the 24th of June, 2022. But do you know the actual history of how Roe v. Wade came into being in the first place? On today's edition of Family Talk, guest co-host Michelle Bachman will be discussing this issue with her special guest, Alan E. Parker Jr. He'll be talking about some of the facts of the origin of Roe v. Wade that may surprise you. Now, Alan Parker Jr. was the lead counsel for two women who were once used to usher in the legalization of abortion. And with Alan, they fought to rescind the egregious law that ultimately led to the deaths of millions of babies. During this current election season, it's our prayer that this evil act will become unthinkable as well as illegal, and many states will in fact be deciding whether or not to enshrine abortion laws into their state constitutions or to abolish it altogether. Well, here now is Michelle Bachman to introduce her guest, Alan E. Parker Jr., right here on Family Talk. Welcome to Family Talk. I'm Michelle Bachman, Dean of the Robertson School of Government at Regent University. We're a biblical worldview university with undergrad, master's, and PhD programs. But I also serve on the board of directors here at the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. And I am so honored to serve alongside Dr. James Dobson. Today, I am very excited about our guest. We are going to talk with a man whom you may have heard of before. He has been on the front lines of the fight for protecting human life in the courtroom, and his name is Mr. Alan Parker Jr. Let me give you just a little bit of a background on Alan before I welcome him to the show. Alan is the president of the Justice Foundation. It's a nonprofit public interest litigation firm based in Texas, but he was also the lead attorney for Norma McCorvey. You may have heard of her name. She was the woman who was used in the Roe versus Wade decision, and Alan represented Norma from the year 2000 to 2012. But interesting Alan also represented Sandra Kano, and she is the woman who was used in the Doe v. Bolton case. People have heard of Roe versus Wade, but there was a second case, Doe v. Bolton. Those two cases together gave the United States of America abortion and legalized abortion. And Alan represented both Norma and Sandra in their efforts to overturn these two landmark cases that legalized abortion in America. But Alan has recently released a new book that is so exciting. It's called Reversing Roe vs. Wade, My Journey with Roe, Doe, and God. And we are going to talk about that book today. So help me welcome to Family Talk Radio, Alan Parker. Alan, welcome to the show today. I know on behalf of Dr. Dobson and his wife, Shirley, they're sending you their regards and listening to you on this show today. So, Alan, welcome to Family Talk. Thank you, Michelle. It's a great honor to be with you and to be on Dr. Dobson's program is a tremendous honor. He's done so much for America through all the years he's been in service. He is. One of the pillars of his and Shirley's life is to stand for the unborn. He's been unashamedly pro-life, and his organization has been unashamedly pro-life. And Alan, you have brought your skills to bear, and God used you in a remarkable way. First of all, just by way of background, you became a lawyer in 1979. You graduated from the University of Texas School of Law. So would you just briefly tell our audience just a little bit of your story? How did you eventually become involved in the fight to protect human life in the courtroom, and especially as a man? Why has this pro-life movement been so important to you, Alan? Well, thank you. I was a law student, and I really wasn't a Christian at the time. Uh, I went to church. I'd married a Presbyterian, so I was one by marriage. But uh, (laughs) 
it wasn't until I got out of law school and I surrendered my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I said, if you want me to stop being a lawyer, I'll stop being a lawyer. If you want me to go to Africa, I'll be in Africa. I knew there was a God, but I knew I was running away from God. So it was 1981. I surrendered my life to the Lord. And I said, whatever you want me to do from this point forward, I'll do. And I meant it. And that's when I feel I became born again. I started wanting to read the scripture and through an amazing series of sequences, the Lord, once I surrendered my life to them, he miraculously brought me to be a law professor at a law school in San Antonio, Texas. I had uh, told the Lord I'd do whatever I want. I never dreamed he'd make me a law professor. But And uh, you taught a particular topic when you were a law professor. What was the name of the class you taught? Well, civil procedure was my basic subject and also human rights. And uh, and civil procedure to all the non-lawyers who are listening to us. What in the world is civil procedure? Well, that's how to try lawsuits. That's litigation in a civil trial, not a criminal trial. And the amazing thing about that, Alan, is that you being a law professor for civil procedure, how to try a case, the basic rules, that set you up uniquely when you later on became acquainted with the human life issue. Yes. And yet it is amazing that even though I was a professor of civil procedure, when I taught, I didn't know this rule that I would ultimately use. (laughs) So what happened in the year 2000 was I began to represent Norma and Sandra, Roe and Doe. Norma and Sandra were their real names. And on February 11th, of the year 2000, Sandra Kano called me and asked me if I would represent her in a case where she was going to do a friend of the court brief on behalf of a, a young woman who'd been forced to have an abortion. Because one of the ways that abortion hurts women in America is once you make abortion legal, it allows other people to force women to have an abortion. And we eventually, after collecting all these testimonies, we now have a center against forced abortions where you can stop forced abortion. The three most common types are adult parents forcing a minor daughter to abort their grandchild. The second is a man forcing a woman to abort his child. And the third is human trafficking and prostitution. And this is what a lot of people didn't understand. Back in 1973, when Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Bolton were decided, and again, Alan, just to back up, we'll come back to forced abortions, but just to back up a bit so that our audience understands. A lot of our audience are younger people, and the 1973 decision changed life for people in the United States. Tell us a little bit about Roe and Doe when they first came about and how shocking and radical this was to American life when these decisions were decided. Yes. In 1970, Norma McCorvey filed a lawsuit in the Dallas Federal District Court seeking to set aside Texas's criminal abortion statute. In Texas, it was a crime for a woman to get an abortion. And the woman wasn't the one who was going to be a criminal. It was the doctor who performed the abortion, correct? That's right. We did not criminalize the woman's behavior because she was being lied and misled by the doctor that was going to be performing it. But in Norma's case, she wanted an abortion, but she never had an abortion because it took three years to get to the Supreme Court and strike down the law. It only takes nine months to have a baby So she became a plaintiff in the lawsuit, and in my book is the sworn testimony of Norma McCorvey about how this came about, that we actually presented to the Supreme Court in our cases asking the Supreme Court to reverse it. So what I'm telling you is in the book, but it's also you can read the sworn testimony of Norma herself. So she basically didn't understand what abortion was. She thought like John Wayne movie. They're going to abort the mission. They're going to make her unpregnant. And of course, that's still one of the lies of the abortion industry today. They'll tell you it's just a mass of tissue. It's not a human being. When women ask the basic question a woman wants to know, is it a baby? 
They'll say things like, don't be stupid. It's just a mass of tissue. That was one of the cases. And that's that was one of the biggest lies that was perpetrated across the United States. I remember that. I remember I was 17 years old, standing by my high school locker. Somebody came in the commons area, and they said that abortion had been passed by the Supreme Court. And I remember turning to the student standing next to me at the locker, and I said, well, what's abortion? I'd never heard of it. Most of my friends had never even heard of the word abortion. We didn't know. And at that time, a lot of scientific advances have happened since 1973. We were lied to in the media, weren't we, Alan? And Norma McCorvey was lied to as well. And she was told that that unborn child that she was carrying wasn't a baby. It was just, like you said, a blob of tissue. It, was, it wasn't life. The most they could say it was potential human life. And so this was a lie that persisted for almost 50 years. It's hard to believe, Alan. It really is. And in 1973, in the Supreme Court decision itself, it said, at this state in the development of man's knowledge, we in the judiciary cannot know when life begins. But that was kind of a lie. There was plenty of evidence right then. Plenty of evidence. We knew then that human life began at fertilization, at conception, that once the sperm and the egg met, that was a new, independent, unique, never-before-seen life, that the only thing that that conception needed was nutrition, water, and time. And it left uninterrupted, that would be a baby that would be born nine months later. That's right. And the court didn't know that abortion would damage women because abortion was illegal almost everywhere in the United States. Uh, And I think that's important people realize that, Alan, because, uh, again, people today, younger people today don't realize that abortion was illegal in the United States up until 1973. Isn't that right? That is correct. In fact, in the Dobbs decision that reversed Roe v. Wade eventually, that we're going to get to at the end of our our story, (laughs) Justice Alito, writing for the majority, revealed something to me that it wasn't even until 1963 that the first law review article ever came out even suggesting that there was a right to abortion in the United States Constitution. Mm. It was like it hadn't even been dreamed of. And from my perspective, 63 is critical because in 1962, the Supreme Court had removed voluntary prayer from the public schools and broken our covenant with God that we had entered into as a nation saying, we want to try to be a godly nation, We won't succeed. We'll have to repent and turn back to God many times. But we based our law on the Judeo-Christian tradition of the law. And 62, we said, God, we don't want you in our school anymore. We don't want your protection. We don't want you in national life. We began, a lawless court began to strip all of the American heritage out. And one year later, the first law review article saying there's a right to kill children. That's right. It was 1962, removing prayer and then Bible reading from the schools. And we saw one thing after another. But you're really, I'm so grateful that you pointed that out. That's probably not a coincidence that we saw the first law review article written about actually legalizing abortion, because up until that point, the thought really didn't even enter into people's minds that there would even be an option to stop a pregnancy by taking a human life. But, Alan, I have no doubt listening today to Family Talk are numerous women who made the decision to have abortion, for whom this conversation may be very difficult to listen to. And so you are the president of the Justice Foundation. Your website is thejusticefoundation.org. And you have resources for women, don't you, that talk to women who have had abortion. God offers forgiveness 
for every person who's ever had an abortion or ever contemplated or been a part of an abortion. And tell us just a little bit, what does the Justice Foundation have at your website, thejusticefoundation.org, by way of helpful materials? Well, when the Lord called us to do this work in the year 2000, he told us to collect the testimonies of women hurt by abortion. And we learn many ways that women are damaged, hurt, suicide, suicide attempts, yes. depression, anxiety, anniversary reactions, inability to bond with other children, sexual functions, substance abuse, on and on and on the list goes, nightmares, mm -hmm. etc. But it's not the unforgivable sin. Even though many women have said, I felt like a murderer, or they'll mm. say, I could never forgive myself, even if God would forgive me. But you have mm -hmm. to learn that if God forgives you, then you just have to accept God's forgiveness. That's it right. is God who does the forgiving. And if, if he says, my son paid the price for your sin, you don't need to carry the burden. You don't need to do penance. You don't need to punish yourself. He took the punishment that all our sin deserves on the cross and there is healing and forgiveness. That's so right. on our website at the Justice Foundation, the project for women to give their testimonies is called Operation Outcry. And on that same page is all the resources for abortion recovery programs all across the nation. There are hundreds and thousands of abortion recovery programs well, let's talk about that, Alan, a little bit more, the outcry. First, I just want to make sure that we cover the two lies that were told about abortion all across America. And I, we talked about the first one. The first lie women were told and society was told is that it's not a baby. What's inside of you, in your womb, this isn't a baby. That was a major lie. And the second lie that was put forward in society, but also really before the Supreme Court, is that abortion is good for women because they saw that they equated pregnancy to a disease, that pregnancy was the bad thing, and that women should be relieved of the burden of pregnancy. Never before was that seen that way in the United States. This was a happy, excited, anticipated event, pregnancy. Now before the Supreme Court, pregnancy was seen as a disease. Exactly. And up to that point, the pro-life movement had been saying, it is a baby, and you can prove that with science. But they really didn't have a good answer to, it's good for women. And I went to my first March for Life in the year 2000, and on the way back in the Dallas airport, the idea that Norma and Sandra could file their own motions and that we would have to have evidence came to me in that Dallas airport. I felt that I knew the law is written on man's heart. We have a conscience. And I didn't think you could kill someone, take a life without it deeply impacting you. Yes. And in fact, it did. It deeply impacted Norma. It deeply impacted Sandra. So two things here. We're talking about the outcry, which is women telling their stories, because the lie that we were that all of society was told is that abortion is good for women. It helps women. You don't want to be pregnant. You don't want to give birth to a child. It's comparable to a disease. So that is the story that was told. And in the 1973 decision, the lie that this isn't really a baby, women were told that, and then the lie that this is really good for you. In 1973, that was the view. But Alan, as you had said along the way, that both Norma and Sandra, who were the two women used to bring about legal abortion in the United States, they had a change of heart. Can you tell us a little bit about that change of heart that Norma and Sandra had? Yes. For the first time in American history that we know of, two people who won landmark Supreme Court decisions wanted to go back to the court and reverse their own cases. Had that ever happened, Alan? Had you ever heard of that happening? Never have. And I study at the Supreme Court all the time in history. No one's ever pointed it out. And now it's even more amazing that these two people who wanted their cases reversed 
were successful, and God has now <laughs> reversed those two Supreme Courses. And both of those decisions, I think for older people, they recognize what a huge tidal wave, how a Roe versus Wade completely changed American life. It completely changed our view, our manners, our traditions, our laws. It's hard to overstate how much Roe versus Wade changed this country. But the fact that both Norma and Sandra, and I understand that both Norma and Sandra had an encounter with the living God. They both gave their lives to Christ. And one thing you wrote about in your book that was so telling, Alan, you wrote about the overwhelming guilt and shame that each one of them felt because you would talk to me offline about the fact that since they prevailed in their cases in 1973, a staggering 70 million unborn human beings lost their lives in abortion. And Sandra and Norma felt the weight and the guilt and the shame of being a part of bringing about ending the lives of 70 million Americans. And it's millions more than that across the world. And so they had this change of heart and then you met them and it's something absolutely remarkable happened in your relationship and encounter with Sandra and with Norma. Yeah, let me explain that both a little bit. In Norma's case, it was in 1995. She had been pro-abortion from 73 to 95, but she never had an abortion. But she began to work in abortion clinics to earn a living. Mm. And it was while she worked in the abortion clinics that she saw the callousness, the carelessness, the lack of concern, lack of counseling for women, and her conscience began to bother her she would hear the pitter-patter of little feet in the abortion clinic. She literally heard it. She yes. literally could hear feet. Yes. Yeah. And then when she felt like she could hear uh, flowers crying outside the clinic. But of course, it was just her conscience. Well, mm. uh, the, some sidewalk counselors began to witness to her. They invited her to go to church, and she heard John 3.16, and she went down to the altar to unburden herself from her sin and guilt mm. and accept Jesus Christ as her Savior because John 3.16 says, whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And, and Norma believes she got saved and she got free. <laughs> that's right. She got baptized on ABC TV in a swimming pool back in the backyard <laughs> in Dallas. Now, Sandra was a little different. Sandra never wanted an abortion. She told me this incredible story of fraud and deception in her case. She said, Mr. Parker, that case has been a doom on my shoulders from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And she said, I never wanted an abortion. I fled to Oklahoma while the case was going on. They packed my suitcase and said, tomorrow, you're going to have to go into Grady Public Hospital and get an abortion. Because Sandra experienced forced abortion. She had pressure from people forcing her to actually get an abortion. Yes, but she picked up that suitcase and fled to Oklahoma <laughs> to avoid having the abortion. She said, Mr. Parker, I'd never kill a baby. I knew that was wrong. Yeah. And she'd had some of her own children taken away from her by Child Protective Services, and she was trying to get them back. So, and, and you tell that story in your book, and it's a powerful book. Again, I urge everyone to get it. It's called Reversing Roe versus Wade, My Journey with Roe, Doe, and God by Alan E. Parker Jr. And Alan was involved in reversing Roe versus Wade. Again, the two women who were used to bring about legal abortion in America, Norma McCorvey in Roe versus Wade and Sandra Kano in Doe v. Bolton, those two cases legalized abortion in 1973, but miraculously, both women got saved. Both women were burdened over their story, but also they wanted to get their story out. And they spoke hundreds of times giving their story of how they were lied to, their pain, what abortion meant, and how they were used and misused to bring about abortion. In Psalm 139, verse 13, David writes, For you formed my inward parts. You, Lord, knitted me together in my mother's womb. 
God reminds us that even before we were born, He knew us and wrote all of our days. What a powerful conversation today here on Family Talk with our special guest, Alan E. Parker Jr., and his conversation with our guest co-host, Michelle Bachman. Be sure to join us again tomorrow for the conclusion of this discussion, as they'll be talking about how God moved to overturn the horrific law, Roe v. Wade. And by the way, if you'd like to learn more about Alan E. Parker Jr. or his newest book called Reversing Roe v. Wade, My Journey with Roe, Doe, and God, simply visit our website at drjamesdobson.org forward slash family talk. That's drjamesdobson.org forward slash family talk. Thinking about the number of women whose lives have been impacted by abortion, and think about the number of women and men who fight so hard to protect the sanctity of human life. Here at the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute, we've partnered with Dr. Owen Strand to encourage moms, wives, sisters, and daughters to affirm what God's design for women really is. We've created a free PDF document called What is a Woman According to God? And you can download it absolutely free when you go to drjamesdobson.org forward slash family talk. Well, I'm Roger Marsh. Thanks so much for joining us today. And may God continue to richly bless you and your family as you continue to grow deeper in relationship with him. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute.